Ave Dulcissima Maria, music by Gesualdo, performed by the Oxford Camerata, Jeremy Summerlee conducting. You're listening to Winnipeg's Classic 107. I'm Bill Richardson with you until 6 this evening. The time is 4.34. And as I've been saying over the course of the afternoon, uh, composer Andrew Balfour, who is uh, also one of the founders of Camerata Nova, and Christopher Jackson have joined me in the studio. Uh, Christopher, who has... uh, a long uh, association with the uh, Studio de Musique Ancienne de Montréal. Uh, Christopher, is that say, are, are you, in fact, the founder of... Uh, yes, the, yeah. yes, I'm the founder. And this is the 40th anniversary, isn't it? Because it was 74. Math is not my strong suit, but I make that 40 years. We are the senior citizens <laughs> of early music in Canada. 40 years. Yeah. It's amazing. Well, we'll talk about uh, Camerata Nova and Gesualdo, of course, in just a second. But as long as I have you there, maybe you can... Um, uh, satisfy my curiosity on a point about uh, er- early music, which I, I, I love and, and love to play as, as much as I can uh, here, here on Classic 107. But it, it's that thing about why it's taken such deep root in Montreal. Uh, it, 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 yeah. Everywhere one finds it, in Vancouver, very active, Toronto, very active. Uh, but, but Montreal especially seems to be a bit of an epicenter. Pourquoi? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's well, I can't answer it uh, in in full for for sure. I mean, it's one of these things that happens. But I think when we did our first concert in 1974, um, uh, there was tremendous interest in it already, and we hung out our shingle and um, cobbled together this bunch of people. We were a real mix, a bit of a dog's breakfast, actually. I mean, you can imagine what it was like back then. And um, 350 people showed up at the first concert. Isn't that amazing? So I think there's always been uh, a really strong interest there. And the other thing I noticed, which is very interesting, is you found the same people going to the Société de Musique Contemporaine yeah. as you go as, as, as our concert. So that was also kind of interesting. There's always been a link uh, between the two uh, a bridge between these contemporary and early music. So, I don't both know the part on the listeners and the players as well, because it seems mm-hmm. to me that, that musicians who are attracted to one are very often drawn to the very other. Very so. often drawn to the other, exactly. So it's very, it's a very interesting place for that. We have about eighteen groups now. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, one thing that both uh, con- contemporary music and uh, well, I don't know what, what we want to call it ancient music, hardly that, but uh, uh, music which brings a, a kind of um, historical imperative to it. But what, what mm-hmm. they what they have in common, I think, is there's a kind of joy of discovery, because. Uh, maybe this is not quite so much so anymore with uh, er- early music, uh, as so much has been uncovered. But there's there there's so much to be found in archives, and there's so much to be determined about performance practice. And and so the the sound often has about it something that, although it's uh, centuries old, seems quite new. Uh, yes, and that certainly is part of the of the cachet is to be able to find new things that have been. Um, not heard before, you know, especially, you know, since opening up all the Eastern uh, Bloc countries has been, you know, brought a whole lot of new repertoire to light. Um, but the other part of the discovery is also just finding out more about what made that music tick to, mm-hmm. to start with, you know, what lies beneath the page. And it's, that's, that's pr- for me, even more interesting, I find. Well, which brings us uh, quite neatly then to the the man of the hour, uh, Saturday evening and uh, Sunday afternoon at Crescent Fort Rouge uh, United Church, which is where Camerata Nova uh, hangs its collective hat whilst performing. And uh, this is the concert called Where's Gesualdo? Uh, Carlo Gesualdo, I have his dates right here, 1561 to 1613. So, Andrew Balfour, tell me, uh, how did you find yourself drawn to uh, Gesualdo? And tell me a little bit about the dude, because it's an extraordinary life. Well, the dude actually is extraordinary, and uh, I've actually always been uh, fascinated by the story. Obviously, we all know him as sort of being a scoundrel, murderer. Well, no, I don't think we all do. So, oh, yeah. well, I, well, it, I'll, by all means, um, he murdered his first wife and uh, her lover. Um, well, actually, he had thugs, his own servants, that did that, uh, the dirty deed. Um, and, and, you know, we kind of based our, 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 our existence or our, our, our sort of reality around this man that actually did this murder. But actually what I found more fascinating is I believe him to be the most profound, uh, perhaps for, you know, before Bach, before Beethoven, um, the most profound uh, composer um, of all time. It's, just, it's fascinating because I really think he wrote extremely complex um, music for his time, and we're talking about the, the you know the early seventeenth, sorry, late sixteenth, early seventeenth century. 
Um, he didn't have a boss. He didn't have to write within the confines of the church. He, he was a nobleman. He was a nobleman. He was the, he was the cousin of the Pope. Um, that's probably one of the reasons, actually, he got, uh, you know, basically got uh, away with cold-blooded murder. Um, but I think that Christopher also would agree with me that the last, you know, several years of his life, I think that he really kind of, like, felt guilty about it. Um, and I think he really expressed himself a lot, the guilty, the penitential um, feeling uh, in, in his music. And we're doing a lot of his music that was written, you know, in the last uh, several years of his life. Um, and I think it's very profound music. It's not Monteverdi. It's, you know, it's not uh, Palestrina. It's very, very different. And as Christopher has been talking in rehearsals the last couple of days, it takes you on a journey as a singer. And all the singers, w we're not used to like this, this style of music. W you, when you're singing it, it doesn't go where you think it's going to go. <laughs> the cadences are very different. The intervals are very different. And Christopher is actually exploring with us so kind of what we can and, 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 and what he has m much to offer in this style of singing. Christopher, I'll ask you to uh, come to the, the microphone there and, and just say a little bit about uh, the um, when, when, when you look under the rock of the music, what you find squirming there. Because uh, <laughs> when, when, when I, 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 I first uh, uh, was learned of uh, just while through a, a recording that Robert Kraft was involved in, and Marilyn Horn was one of the singers on it as well. As oh, really? from, from, from the 50s, I think this recording yeah, came out. Yeah. And, and when I heard it, I couldn't quite believe what, what I was hearing because it, it sounded, yeah. well, it just sounded so loopy. It sounded so out there. So what is it about that music that is so uh, surprising? Well, it's experimental music. I mean, I, he, frankly, you know, he's brilliant. Uh, Jaswaldo's brilliant, right? But I think if he had lived today, they would probably give him some good medication as well. Yeah, no doubt. Um, but uh, <clears throat> um, um, he, was, he was obviously, a, um, I think he was a very troubled person, at the same time very brilliant and, so, and very skilled, obviously, in the craft of, of manipulating this very... Um, very closed um, environment of uh, polyphonic music, which was the language of that time. And he was also living in a time where there was a lot of experimentation going on elsewhere. But um, his version of it was quite unique in the sense that he pushed the envelope much farther than anybody else did. But he didn't really break that many rules. Mm. You know, he got off by the because the rules are really important. You had to, you're not allowed to do certain things in this mm -hmm. kind of writing, and they're still observed today. We teach all of these rules of counterpoint in in uh, music history and music uh, theory courses in university. We it's the same thing. So he he was pretty good at that. He he would push things to their absolute limit of tolerability. Yeah. But um, unlike Monteverdi, who was very criticized for going ahead and just breaking the rules and. Not, you know, he, he suffered for it. For well, doing that. I, I think it's it, it is probably a mistake to try to ally the facts of biography with the evidence of art, because probably the two things, in fact, don't have very much to say to each other. But especially but, the farther back you go. You yeah, know. but but mm -hmm. do you think that the the chances that he took and the darkness that comes through in these pieces, do you think it was expressive in some way of his personality? I think so. yeah. yeah, I think Andrew's right there. I think uh, definitely that there's some, that there's, a, there's a lot of penitential music written at the end of his life, for instance. We're doing some of those pieces right now, and they're extremely powerful. And it does feel authentically coming from him uh, as a kind of his own, his own testament. Uh -huh. Were his texts <coughs> always sacred texts, or did he use a secular text as well? Oh, no, he used a lot of a lot of poetry, by like Petrarch, for instance, one of the most popular poets of the of the period, and he 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 put a lot of that to music, just as everybody else did. Lots of madrigals, lo a very large body of work. Okay, Andrew, um, I know that you and uh, a, a colleague, and you should say who, uh, have have written pieces that are inspired in some way by Jesualdo. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes, um, Michael McKay has written a piece called Miserere May, uh, Have Mercy on Us, O God, um, and it is very, very unique. Uh, those of you who know the Mike McKay's music, um, it's very theatrical. It's I would actually put it as a, a little mini opera, I think. Um, it's a it's a brilliantly crafted piece, and it kind of goes right into the uh, the nuts and bolts of the actual murder. Um, many people actually play different parts. Uh, I think it's in twelve parts, Christopher. Like uh, it's in twelve parts. Uh, twelve parts. Yes. So it's uh, we're, we're actually people play certain uh, uh, characters in this piece. So it's a a little bit of a combination of kind of a 
choral with opera, um, and it's going to be very unique. Um, and I wrote a piece called Cartolina da Venosa, which is kind of like a, a based on the fictional idea of Gesualdo writing postcards to either his wife, his dead wife at the time, or himself. Um, it's up in the air right now I mean, in terms of how you interpret it, but uh, it's very crunchy. It's very kind of um, demanding, um, as, as Christopher can probably attest, uh, getting all this music together because, you know, it is unique that we're doing early music, but also we, as, as per Cam Radanova, we like to do... Um, new music as well too and uh, my hat's off to Christopher for pre pre preparing this concert so um, exquisitely and you know it, it's a, just a lot of fun right now so with the new music and with the old music it's uh, quite a quite a thrill actually for us as singers and hopefully for the audience as well this weekend. I'm sure that anytime you and the other singers in the choir have a chance for this kind of immersion in, in the work of one composer and, and maybe especially one whose work is as uh, idiosyncratic and as challenging as just Waldo, th that um, it it takes you to a different kind of level as a group. When when you emerge from this and move on to whatever is next, how, do you feel that it's in some way oh, I don't know is, is is transformative too grand an idea? Not at all. Actually, I I totally feel transformed by this. Um, we don't get a chance to sing this style of music at this level even for Camerata. And we've introduced a lot of early music in the last maybe 10 years. Um, you know, last year we did the complete Monteverdi Vespers, and that was a huge uh, uh, opportunity for us to present this music at a high level um, in into uh, Winnipeg, the audiences. But now we're actually going a cappella, and Camerata actually started, when we started back in 1997, this was our modus operandi. Uh, we basically wanted to sing a, a cappella music, but this is even a higher level because back then it was Palestrina and a little bit of Monteverdi. But this concert, actually, we're doing Gisualdo, we're doing Monteverdi, we're doing Orlando de Lassus, um, we're also doing Avo Pert along with myself and uh, Mike McKay's pieces. So we're actually all over the place, aren't we? I mean, yep. we even do a little bit of Stravinsky too because, and that's sort of an uh, homage to, in the early 20th century, Stravinsky and like-minded composers discovered um, Gisualdo's part books and basically brought it to the world, you know, so um, it was very new to them and uh, Stravinsky, Schoenberg, uh, Alan Berg, you know, all these uh, second Viennese composers basically discovered this music and and uh, thought this guy's this guy's whacked. He's great. <laughs> <laughs> you have <laughs> to pay attention to him. World. He got away with murder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So okay. It was big for them. So Christopher, I'll ask the last question of you. Um, and uh, that's, uh, it's, uh, I guess, um, a, a kind of complimentary question to the one I just asked. Andrew, when, when you have the opportunity to come and work with singers who or, uh, and uh, singers and musicians, as though the two are separate things. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's like I poets like and writers. She's a <laughs> she's a poet and also a writer. You know <laughs> what? What's that mean? Uh, but w w when you have a chance to come to work with uh, with musicians who happen to be singers, mm -hmm. uh, who are not the people with whom you're, you're accustomed to working, uh, how does that work for you? What what do you take from it? Uh, well, that's a good, uh, very interesting question for me because uh, um, uh, every time I, I'm a little apprehensive, I'm working with the same outfit for 40 years, mm -hmm. and we definitely have our reflexes. Uh, um, our rehearsals don't have many words spoken, uh, just eyebrows raised or <laughs> silences. <laughs> so uh, Mugs thrown. Sometimes putting into words the things that I've assumed or taken for granted is a, a bit of a stretch for me. Um, but I really enjoy it, um, uh, and this is a very enthusiastic group. They're very, you know, intensely engaged. That that's that always brings something new. Um, so no, it's great fun, and I I do this quite fairly often. There's another group in New Brunswick where I, I go, uh, Carol Louis Bull, and uh, I work with them as well. Hmm. Um, and what have you got planned for the uh, studio in in uh, Montreal to celebrate the 40th anniversary? Um, well, I'm sure you'll be able to guess what we're going to do. <laughs> Spend an allium, of course. <laughs> the Talus 40 part motet, yeah. which we're doing with uh, with a great choir from New York City, uh, the choir of uh, Trinity Wall Street. Oh, uh, fantastic. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Well, listen, I thank you both very, very much for making the time to come in. I know it's a busy time for each of you. And uh, Christopher Jackson and Andrew Balfour um, uh, with uh, Cam. Well, Andrew is the uh, founder of Camerata Nova. And as you've been hearing, uh, the composer of one of the two uh, new pieces, which are going to be performed as part of their concert called Where's Just Waldo? And that takes place Saturday evening at 8 p.m. and Sunday afternoon at 3 at Crescent uh, Fort Rouge United Church, just there at the corner of Wardlaw and Nassau.
And uh, tickets are, I'm going to be assuming, and are available via your website and probably at the door as yeah. well. Okay. So uh, check that out uh, for sure. Uh, fascinating music by a fascinating composer. And uh, I'll play you some more now. This is, uh, oh, I, in fact, I, I've got a computer screen here that just gives half titles. I have no idea what it is, but it's music by Jess Waldo, performed by the Oxford Camerata. I'll play it and I'll tell you later. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 